Hello, I'm Bernard Hickey from interest.co.nz and welcome to another in our series of double shot interviews where we talk to someone interesting about something interesting. And today we have Stephen Topless, who's the head of research at BNZ, who's come out with his view on the economy for the next year or so. Stephen, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, what's your view on what's happening in Europe and how that might affect China? Yeah, I mean, Europe is a basket case, there's no other way you can describe it. Um, and it will remain that way for, for a very long time. At this stage, though, um, the, the issue in terms of Europe is, is whether it does affect uh, the, the global economy rather than whether it affects Europe per se. And one of the links to that is whether or not it undermines uh, China. We don't think it will, um, despite the fact that China um, exports more to Europe than anywhere else. Unequivocally, it will slow it down. Um, but fundamentally, um, it has a big enough domestic economy, uh, which is growing at a rapid pace, to ensure that the Chinese economy keeps growing. But isn't it quite dependent on exports and investment? It is, but the Chinese authorities themselves have a stated policy of changing the way that the Chinese economy works. And one of those stated policies is to reduce their dependence on exports and to increase their dependence on private consumption. It hasn't worked well, so far, though. Well, it has to the extent that the Chinese economy is still growing at 8% per annum, um, albeit slowing. Uh, and we are seeing the Chinese authorities starting to ease monetary conditions. And, you know, if you look at, we sort of put it in perspective, in New Zealand, private consumption accounts for roughly two thirds of GDP. Um, in the United States, it accounts for around 72% of GDP. In China, it accounts for 35% of GDP. So what they're trying to do is get the Chinese to spend rather than save. Or another way of looking at that is they're trying to get the Chinese authorities to funnel the money that they're currently giving to the Americans, the Europeans, anywhere else, back into their own economy. So I think they're very well placed to do that. One thing you talked about was the potential for a financial um, crisis in Europe, potentially a failure of a large bank, affecting uh, the rest of the world and talking about those monetary mechanisms, that, of the, systems of the, the way that the banking systems mm -hmm. can interact. How do you think New Zealand's um, shaping up to, to deal with something like that? Yeah, I mean, first point is they've got a financial crisis. It's not, <clears throat> you know, are you going to get one or not? They've got one. Um, the, the issue, therefore, is how does it affect New Zealand? And unfortunately, New Zealand is a nation of net dis savers, so we have to borrow from the rest of the world. And Europe's one of the places that we've borrowed from traditionally. So probably the biggest single threat to the New Zealand economy is that we can't get that supply of finance through to our banking system. So what that will mean is that we have to adjust the way we do things here. Now, that could take any one of a number of forms. It might mean that we borrow from the Asians, for example. Um, it might mean that the Asian banks set up in New Zealand to lend to, to New Zealanders. Uh, it might mean that the Reserve Bank has to step into the breach and, and fund the New Zealand banking system. Uh, it might mean that corporate New Zealand goes directly to, to the retail base for its money and bypasses the, uh, the banking system, or it might mean that the banking system itself just reduces its asset base and says, sorry, we can't lend. Now, it will probably be a combination um, of, of all those things, and vacuums never last for long. Um, so someone or some form of uh, will always fill it. Uh, I'm confident that will happen. I'm also confident New Zealand's very well placed to do that. But the the mechanism as we move from dependency on Europe to something else uh, may be difficult. Now you mentioned also in your presentation that you expected uh, the uh, construction sector to uh, grow over the next couple of years, partly because of what's happening in commercial property. Talk to us about how commercial property in New Zealand has been affected by the earthquake in Christchurch. Yeah, well there's two links to that. There's one, the obvious one, which is the Christchurch buildings themselves and, and the fact that they will need to be rebuilt. But I think people still haven't got their heads around the fact that Christchurch has implications for every commercial building in New Zealand. Um, and that for all intents and purposes, the entire commercial building stock of New Zealand has now been revalued. Uh, stuff that's, and it's dependent on whether it's earthquake proof or not. Um, if it's earthquake proof, then its value is probably going up. Uh, and clearly the, the extent to which it's not earthquake proof, um, it will be going down. So there's gonna be a massive amount of remedial work are required right the way across the commercial building stock of New Zealand in order to make those buildings earthquake compliant and that clearly is going to support economic activity over the next few day, years. But the implications for those who own older commercial property is quite profound isn't it? Absolutely. You know, um, 
they will probably, in the first instance, get a direct valuation impact. Uh, but also, if they intend holding on to that building, uh, then they're going to meet um, f massive future costs uh, in terms of, of fixing it. But in the interim, uh, very, very high insurance costs, or in fact, no insurance at all. Um, and there will be a lot of owners of buildings in New Zealand uh, who are very uh, wary at the moment. So that's like a second round impact of the earthquake, but throughout New Zealand, particularly provincial New Zealand and, and those with older buildings. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, age needn't necessarily be a problem, of course, it's the type of construction. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, very old wooden buildings in New Zealand that um, still look um, like they can cope with anything. Um, but th there's no doubt that um, a, a lot of building owners, and you say particularly in the provincial areas who probably haven't even thought about this, uh, will need to have a very, very close look. The other aspect of construction is housing construction. And you say that uh, we're going to increase construction probably from around the 11, 12,000 houses a month, a, a year mark to something closer to 16, 17,000. How is that going to happen when many uh, property developers uh, uh, are uh, not able to get finance for their projects? Mm. Well, I mean, in the first instance, of course, um, a significant contribution will come from Christchurch and a significant part of that will be insurance money. Um, so that's, that's externally funded. Your point about the property developers is, is valid and um, I think what we're going to see is a movement away from, at least for a short period of time, away from the traditional developer putting up a whole pile of houses um, with finance from, say, a non-bank financial institution and then waiting for people to buy them, back to, I guess, how it used to be, and that was that people had to decide to build a house give the builder a deposit with a contract to keep paying them before they start construction. And so I think that you're much more likely to get um, that sort of uh, development occurring rather than uh, the, the mass development from the supply-driven development, if you like, it'll be more demand-driven. And the Productivity Commission came out with a report last week which talked about land supply. Do you think mm. um, that some of these issues need to be addressed or would help in improving the amount of houses being built? Yeah, I mean, that's probably going to have an impact in terms of the pricing um, of, of those buildings. Um, and there is significant evidence that in parts of New Zealand there are issues around, around land supply. I think we've also got to change uh, views on um, building density. We, we tend to run a mile if someone talks about putting an apartment block up, um, but you find the most major cities in the world have very, very large apartment buildings and right smack in the middle, um, and in fact in some of the suburbs, um, and we're not used to, to, to that either. Uh, and generally we have this, I guess it's, it's almost peculiar to New Zealand problem, that we don't have builders that build 40, 50, 60, 100 houses a year. We tend to have building companies run by one guy with two or three labourers that might build one or two houses a year. So there's no economies of scale in that process, and that's quite problematic for New Zealand as well. Stephen Topless there, the Head of Research for BNZ, with his uh, annual economic outlook. I'm Bernard Hickey for interest.co.nz. That was another in our series of double-shot interviews.